Um, what I really want to do is continue some of this conversation. It was really helpful to, to get a sense of where each of you are in terms of your own journey for PLA on your campus. Um, the reason I've, I've titled this uh, presentation, Prior Learning Assessment, and connecting it to adult student success is what I'm finding and what we're finding at Kale across the country is that PLA as a standalone is not very effective. It's only when you position this as part of a larger process or effort for adult student success that we're finding that that gets the attention of legislators, that gets the attention of your, get, get support from college presidents, that's what gets support from uh, faculty groups, is they, if they could understand that this is not just another effort of 50 efforts that we have to and, and add on to the, um, to the shoulders of folks who are already overworked, that if you can somehow find a way to position uh, this uh, prior learning assessment, and I'm using that, that word broadly at the moment, um, that you can really get the support you need. Because nobody, um, almost by definition, I was listening very, uh, very acutely to each of you describe kind of where you're positioned. Um, some of you, we talked about the kind of, you, you, uh, we had a couple of conversations earlier this morning. I don't know why I'm here. I, I was told to be here. And I think that's, that's a fair, if that's where you are, that's, that's where you are. Others of you might be responsible for this PLA effort, or your presidents brought you in and said, hey, we want you to be innovative, we want to, now go, go do it. And by definition, that makes you a change agent on your campus. And um, what I want to do is hopefully provide some uh, mental models that we can talk about and, sh and that might be useful tools for you as you go back to your campus. Um, Christine referred to some different uh, resources and I want to make those available to you. There's actually, uh, I put a copy of a couple of them on your uh, table, but you can find them on our website as well and links and they'll be on this resource. Um, and just, just to go over them for just a brief second, one of them is, is focused on, it's called state adoption, and three years ago we were funded by the Lumina to work with three different states on PLA adoption. And that was Ohio, the Texas A&M system, and Montana. And what this uh, debrief, this, this is kind of a takeaway document that said, here's some of the lessons we learned. We didn't do it right. At, at times. We, we made progress, we're really proud of that, but there's some, there's some war wounds in there. And I think it's, um, as you think of yourself as a change agent on your campus, it might be really helpful to, uh, to learn from folks who have been trying to do the same things ahead of you. The second um, piece is a piece on uh, CBE and PLA, and it's called the CBE Continuum. And about two years ago, well, actually we've done now three convenings in Washington, D.C., each of the last Septembers, uh, the, over the last three years. And what we were doing there was trying to have a discussion about quality assurance in competency-based education. Two years ago, there was 58 colleges that were either exploring or implementing PLA, as far as from what we could find out, what we knew about. This last year, there was close to 600. So you're seeing a huge expansion and in interest for competency-based education. And I know I've had a couple of conversations earlier this morning that there's some real interest there. And as you describe that exploration, you know, only a, only a few of those, only a handful of those are really, if you think of uh, competency-based education as a continuum, only a few of those are really the full direct assessment. You know, Western governors or S Southern New Hampshire most of those are, there, those, in those cases, the flexible degree in Wisconsin, in those cases they've taken their whole con, uh, credit hour curriculum and thrown it out the window and created something totally new that doesn't even translate necessarily in the same way to those credit hours. That's, that's 
they've created a, a, a totally different functioning system. However, 95% of the schools that are exploring CBE are doing some type of crosswalk to their traditional program, and which really brings very uh, prior learning assessment right into the, the sweet spot of what, what you, you might be able to build on or focus on. So that, that's the, the second resource that I hope you, you take advantage of. We have a third resource that I didn't bring copies of with me because it's just being, it's at the printer right now, but it is on our website as a link, and it's called PLA is Your Business. And yeah, we, we, we have, we'll, we'll have a picture of it, but you can go to our website at kale.org and under research and publications for colleges and universities, you can find it. It's called PLA is Your Business. And we think that's a really helpful document because the, one of the, the most common questions we get is, well, what should we charge for, it, for, for, for PLA? What should we, how should we structure this? What is, um, you know, very kind of fundamental operational questions. And what we thought, we surveyed 89 institutions and then we did follow-up in-depth interviews with uh, 12 of them. And so what we are reporting out is what we found. And it's very interesting. If you think of something as straightforward as what do you charge for PLA, it's really an indicator of your, uh, your vision of what PLA is. Is PLA something that needs to make money for the institution? Is it something that needs to cover its costs? Or is it an investment in adult student success that we will, uh, we will take, um, we will make up the difference uh, with better persistence and retention and success numbers? And in an environment where performance funding is, is growing and growing nationally, uh, we have different states taking very different uh, perspectives and, and take a different leadership roles in that way. So, that's, that's a, another document. A fourth document that's attached there is really a, a follow-up on our, our landmark research study on PLA. And in that landmark study, it's called Fueling the Race, that landmark study found that it, it first it tracked uh, 62,000 students over from 48 states of all different types and in all different geographic regions in the country, and it followed them over a seven-year period. And what it found was that students who utilize PLA were two and a half times more likely to graduate. That's pretty, that's pretty remarkable uh, that, that one strategy might have that kind of promise. And to, to further that, it found, and this is kind of counterintuitive, that those, those students on average took 10 credit hours more at that institution. So that, that common myth that said, well, if, if, if we give away PLA, then, then that's less, that they'll take less credit hours at our institution. Actually, that was wrong. On average, across the 62,000 students, 10, 10 credit hours more. So that was, those are some real, and that's what really um, urged us, and, and we garnered uh, foundation support, and we developed uh, what some of you might know is Learning Counts, which is our online prior learning assessment tool. And what that is, it's we still work with institutions who want to do it themselves and we help them build their capacity, or we have an, essentially an outsource option where those who are really wanting consistency across their institution, across their system, they want some process consistency, um, that really speaks to have to that because what we're finding in, in our you know, deeper in our research was that there was uh, a lack of trust between institutions and between even uh, different campuses among in the same institution or even different departments in the same institution about how each department will assess their portfolios or their prior learning. Um, I wanted to just follow up one and we, we had this discussion. I think it's important if you're in these kind of conversations to understand some of the distinctions. Um, what, what ACE and Chris was talking about as credit for prior learning, um, we often call PLA. And to me, I usually, I use those often interchangeably depending on what population I'm talking to. If I'm talking to a student, I often use credit for prior learning. But if I'm talking to a faculty, I'm usually talking about prior learning assessment. But there is a distinction in that 
when you're talking about PLA, you're talking about assessing what the student knows. Whereas what we're talking about, what ACE is doing is, is uh, important, it's an inputs model. So they're talking about what, how is this course built, what are the desired learning outcomes, and what is the desired uh, learning that's supposed to take place. You and I both have been in situations where we might have taken the same class and you learned a lot and I skated. Or, or, and so the, the feedback loops, what employers are telling us is that graduates are coming to them supposedly with certain types of content mastery from their degree programs and the feedback we're getting is that that wasn't the case. So there's a feedback loop coming from our workforce uh, and employers that say, hey, this student doesn't really know this. And now they're, they're feeding that back to us as institutions. And as a former dean, you know, I, I took that, that hat as you know, kind of steward of our institutional and academic mission very seriously. And I wanted to, be, to sleep well at night knowing that our students are actually, uh, I, can, I can stand by that student and say, I know what they know. And, and I think that notion is really underscoring the growth in competency-based education because that notion is it doesn't matter where you learned it, it's what you can demonstrate. And that, um, as I think about how these things operate as change agents on our campus, our faculty, at least the faculty I'm familiar with, are very concerned about that institution, that, that student level learning. What, at the student level, do they know and can demonstrate. Um, so I just threw a bunch of stuff at you, but I, I haven't even got into the slides, but I think it's more important to have a kind of authentic conversation about what, what's keeping you up at night. I mean, you're, you have different roles, and I understood that from your introductions, and I understand that some of it, some of you are really concerned about the academic integrity, some of you are concerned about retention, some of you are concerned about what does this mean for me in terms of student advising? What are some other, some of you are thinking, I, I got the short straw, I had to drive to, to San Antonio, which, which I think is a great thing. So what, what's keeping you up at night? What, when you think of your initiative on your campus, what's the, if you had to pick the one thing that's, you, you need to do to help shepherd this, this process forward? Yeah, so, um, and we're, I'm going to talk about that in a minute in terms of, um, it's really, a, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of a cultural, a, a, a culture. Each of us, each of our institutions has a culture, and you can do some, uh, ask yourself some questions, and I'll provide some questions in a little bit about how, how ready are you to serve adult learners? And I would, pra I would, I would position it more as how do we, support adult student success rather than how do we just do PLA? Because at the end of the day, what matters is are our students succeeding? And, um, but that, you're, you're also touching on a bunch of interrelated um, uh, systems that don't often talk to each other. So you have a faculty system, you have kind of an administrative system, you have um, financial aid and all these student support services. And they all have to come together because really the student doesn't differentiate, right? They don't differentiate between the person in the parking lot that gave them a ticket and uh, the person you know, that's, that's giving them their financial aid. It's how well am I being supported? Yeah. Losing forward, um, and they may have the skill set. Financial aid isn't going to pay for it. Right. And so there, there is it's not cost effective for a student to put upon that. And so 
we don't have systems in place that support this. Right. And so um, I think of this as um, a complex adaptive system. So um, how, are, are folks familiar with the complex adaptive system? The, one of the most re readily kind of, um, at least to, to me, available examples of this, if you think of uh, a taxi system, and I just moved to Chicago so that I'm very in tune with taxis. Historically, you would call dispatch and you would say, I need a ride, and dispatch would, would communicate with their, the different taxis and say, okay, go pick up Scott at this corner. What's changed is Uber or Lyft. And all of a sudden, you have a, a full network of, a, of independent agents. And based on very simple rules, they're getting, and, and the help and the support of technology, they are responding to a request in a way that is much more uh, efficient, that is, that is quicker, that is less expensive for the, the, the person, and it's, it's changing the way, and there's lots of fights going on. In Chicago, there's fights going on in terms of, oh, can you go to the airport or can you not, and all, the, all these types of little distinctions. But it's pretty obvious that the taxi system is never going to be the same. You have these independent agents. And I, I just use that as an example of you have a hierarchical system, which was the past, the dispatch, that top down, somebody at the top, a great, some leader, you know, kind of divvies out who gets to do what. And now you have this network, and you can think of this in terms of any, almost any human or even non-human system, whether it's ants, ant farms. They, they really operate, they do amazing things, but it's based on very simple rules. And um, I think of this in terms of, as a dean, if, I, if I'm the only one that keeps the mission or has a vision for what I want to do, for student support, and I could only respond to that when they get to me. And that's a problem, because I don't have enough hours in the day, and I don't want to give out my personal phone number, and it's, it's, a, it's a mess. But if I have a, 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 an army of independent agents that, that have a shared mental model for what we're trying to accomplish, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter if they talk to the dean, they can talk to almost anybody as long as that's a shared mental model. And what we're talking about with shared mental models is culture. I'm getting into some of my, going into some of my slides, but I, I just, um, I want to, I want to provide some, some mental models for you as you go back and have conversations, because I, I, I gathered just enough from some of my, uh, some conversations that said, well, you know, I'm here because I, I'm supposed to learn about this. I don't really know what that means. Um, and I don't know where this sits in our priority list and, and all those types of things. And I think it's important that you think of yourselves as um, folks who are kind of stewards of your academic mission that care about academic integrity, care about student success, and, and can kind of create a vision for adult student success on our campus. Dolores? Yes. That gets my attention, and I hope it will get the attention of uh, folks at my university, because we're talking about retention, we're talking about graduation, we're talking about student success, so we're talking about those things that uh, are, are, that are the uh, epitome of what we're wanting to achieve. But I realize that you hit it on the head for me when you said that maybe approaching it as PLA, they don't understand PLA, but we certainly understand student success, graduation rates, and retention. So that is almost like a backdoor. Yeah. Read somewhat. And uh, with that being the, the header, they talking about graduation and student success and retention and some things specific to adult students that we can help them to be more successful uh, as they journey through this process. Right, so I, I just want to I want to I want to just share a model that we use at at Kale for our membership, 
and maybe you, it might have some transfer to your situation. Because I look at this um, in, in my experience as a dean and our experience of what we're trying to accomplish, uh, we're always, we're talking about a, a really a movement to, because um, many of our institutions don't even define adult learners as a, a definable variable in our, on our campus. We just think of our, they're, they're our students, they're all our students, right? And in reality, if you think of andragogy, the kind of the study, the, the art and science of teaching adults versus pedagogy, uh, the art and science of teaching kids, what historically, in fact, I, um, historically, if you look at those things, you could say, well, the idea is that the self-concept is that the, you know, kids are dependent, adults need, want self-direction, you know, kids have little experience, learners have, it's a, rich, it's a rich resource from time, you know, you can go down this list and the, the idea is that more and more kids, adults are more and more like traditional students as well. Stu all students want relevance. All students want something they can tie what they care about to. So these things apply to all students, but I think there is value in defining the adult learner, especially in a state like Texas where you have three million adults with some college and, and no degree. So there is a population that's, if you look at nationally speaking, the, the number of adult, uh, you know, uh, high school students coming into higher education versus the available number of adults that are that have some college it's ten times the size so if you really want to make an impact towards a goal like uh, sixty percent degree attainment or uh, what is it sixty by thirty Texas T TX if you really want to make a in fact in with those statistics you could graduate a hundred percent of the eighteen to twenty two year olds that are going from high school to college and you still wouldn't get there. You have to engage the adult learner. You have to. And, and that's, that's the type of thing that all of a sudden we're making a connection to our, to our local campus, to our, our regional competitiveness, to our global economy. And that's, that's why you know, Chris outlined a bunch of states that are being proactive about prior learning assessment because there's a research base it, has, it shows some promise of how do, we, how do we get us ourselves out of this, you know, we're at about 40% degree attainment in the state. How do, we, how do we change those numbers? And for different, you know, that's what these foundations are supporting. Lumina and Kresge and Joyce and those folks are very, Gates, very in tune with big issues, global competitiveness, all, those types of things. So, um, I'm going to go back to this, this, this idea of this, here's a simple mental model. And what's helpful for me about this, I, I think of the folks uh, on the right, let's say champions and party goers, I'm, I'm calling them. I'm thinking this in terms of adult student success. I have, in our membership at Kale, we have a group of champions. We have, it's, it's a small but passionate group. We have about 700 members. And I would, I would, by behavior, I would say about 100 of those are champions. They would be doing adult student success even if there was no kale. They are so committed to it. They're so passionate about adult learners that they would do it on their own. Then we have a big group of what I'd call party goers. They, would, they are folks who, they're like, yeah, I, I get it. I'm, I'm on board. Um, I've got other things going on, but uh, you know I'm open to this. I want you know I want to learn more, and they're truly open to it. That's the group. Uh, I'll talk more about that group in a second. Then we have on the left side, we have a group that I'd call fence sitters. Fence sitters are folks that are saying, you know what, I uh, you know adults are great. I I actually was a traditional student myself. I came to, uh, you know, I was residential, adults are fine if they, if they integrate, you know. 
but I'm not going to stick my neck out and I'm just going to kind of wait and see what happens between the party goers and the naysayers. The naysayers are the folks that are, are basically saying, hey, um, not for me. Not for me. I, I'm, my vision of our student body is a different student. Or I'm thinking about that student in a different way. And what's helpful about this for me is it, in terms of our, our membership at Kale, we don't have a lot of naysayers because they don't join Kale if they're naysayers, <laughs> I hope. Occasionally we do, though. Occasionally we'll have somebody that they got their institution dragged them and they had to go to the conference. And, but we have, we have a lot of folks that are kind of, you know, just, just they'll show up to a conference and that'll be it. And then we have, you know, this party goer group. And what's helpful about this model for me is what we do about it. So when I'm thinking about the champions, what I need to do with the champions, I just need to love and appreciate them. I need to shine the spotlight on them. They're, they're, they're passionate about their work. They're the folks that I want to, to put on a, a platform and have them share with others. Then this party goer group, my, what I want to do with them, that's where I want to incent. I want to incent their participation. I want to show them, I want to connect them with champions. I want to give them opportunities to, uh, to grow professional development opportunities and so on. That's the group. And I want to take a bunch of pictures. I want to, sh because what I want to do with the fence sitters, I want to show them party pics. I want to show them the work that we're doing. I want to show them the good work that we're doing. I want to show them but I don't want to incent them. I want to show them, hey, this is, we're having a party over here. You want to be part of it. I don't want to incent them to be fence sitters because that just em emboldens them to be fence sitters. And then with naysayers, always respectful, but I, I call it judo. I want to deflect their energy. I don't want to take it on because and historically, I'm thinking back to my role as a dean, I spent a ton of time with the naysayers. And it just, it was life, you know, shortening. <laughs> um, and the reality is, is that someone could have, you know, as I'm positioning this in terms of adult student success, someone could be against PLA and still be about, still be for adult student success. So I want to position this as our common ground and those who have a vision for adult student success and those who don't have a vision for adult student success. So if they don't have the vision, it doesn't mean they're bad people, but I certainly don't want to spend all my time and resources with that. I, I certainly don't want to, um, you, know, uh, you know, I want to be, you know, that, that's the part that, you know, I'll, I'll present research to them, I'll share documents, those types of things. We'll do a lot of that. We'll present at conferences. But the reality is we want to spend more time with the folks that are passionate about this. That's where we're going to make progress. And that's where my guess is if you're thinking of yourself as a change agent on your campus, you can be strategic about this. Because what we're finding is the group that is in play is those fence sitters. Can we get those fence sitters to one standard deviation to party goers? And can we get the party goers to become champions. And maybe we'll be able to move a naysayer to a fence sitter. But the, they're most likely not going to do a quantum leap. Right? So I, I, the reason I share this is because I, 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 I see the, the wheels turning with a lot of you and some of the conversations that we've had. And um, it's a difficult place to be. On campus, there's a lot of things going on. It's hard to get traction on any one thing. And but if you can get something where you get some traction on something where there's common ground, adult student success might be a good positioning. One of the, one of the things that we do when we start working with institutions is, is we ask some of the questions about, is there a common language to talk about adults? And if there isn't, then oftentimes we, we recommend the, the, our Alfie toolkit. 
which is the Adult Learner Focused Institution Toolkit. And it's a diagnostic based on nine uh, principles for effectively serving adult learners. And what we do is, what that does, it provides, it's kind of like a 360 for their institution on how well they're serving adult learners. And so you get a student perspective, you get an internal stakeholder perspective. We're building a new version that it gets employer perspective too. And what that does is give you some benchmark data so you can s compare yourself to two-year institutions nationwide or four-year institutions nationwide. And data is really helpful when you're having these types of conversations. So I would, would highly recommend um, looking at that. If you, if you think to yourself, gosh, I don't really know what my, my boss thinks or what his real goal is or her real goal is, or I don't know how to talk, even start this conversation because my faculty is having conversations about the scholarship of teaching and learning or engaged learning or some other f mental framework, which there's some, there's some good ones out there. How do you get traction? I know as a dean, I was on an off-site campus. It was really difficult for me to get, I was by, you know, physically and I was on the margins. And so for me to come to campus and tell anecdotes, uh, you know, sometimes can be effective, but data really helps. The good news is you have really good research that Kale and ACE have, have done that you can, you can, that those can be your friends. And you can also, if you can get a snapshot of your campus climate as it relates to the adult learner, that can be a really effective tool for you. Um, you know, I, I talked about this, this idea of complex adaptive systems. We have um, some more information, and if it, folks are, you are interested in that analogy, I think what's helpful for me about that is um, when you think of a complex adaptive systems, you think about uh, what underlies complex systems is simple rules. What underlies complicated systems is more complicated. And so if you really want to change a, a, you know, an organization, an institution, a higher ed, it's, it's a complex system. And so it's matching the right type of model to, to match what your culture is. Um, and I would make a guess that oftentimes at higher ed institutions we're very hierarchical and we try change. Um, I think there was, I think um, you mentioned this morning, Chris, that uh, you know, a lot of systems are trying to, legislatures are trying to top down these changes and it's not working very well because higher education systems, faculty, they're independent agents. They're, artists who share a storefront in some cases. You know, so um, if you're going to change that type of system, you better have the right mental model or else it's, it's kind of asking for the impossible. Does that make sense? So, you know, we think of w when we engage with, uh, with institutions who are interested in adult student success, we engage them and what we're doing at that point is we're um, evaluating where they are in terms of their readiness to serve adult learners. We're uh, offering new perspectives. You know, we're challenging assumptions. That's on the engage and the evaluate. We're, we're, that's where we're assessing their fitness. We're offering proposals of what, what are things we can do to help. The third, equip, is where we're, we're much more of our, you know, our products and services, our, um, our workshops, kind of real on the, on the ground, helping your capacity. That was our, that's our equip. And then our empower, are those folks who are along the line, we're trying to, that's, that's, they're getting to be adopters and champions. Those are the folks we're trying to encourage. Um, so that's a real simple mental model for, for my team at Kale. But I think the reason I'm sharing it is because I think there's some uh, transfer uh, potential for you as you think about your role in helping PLA succeed on your campus. Um, you know, there, I know there's some different uh, levels of, of um, kind of understanding of or experience with prior learning assessment. 
you know, this is, this is how we're defining it. Um, it's a well-established research and validated methods for assessing non-collegiate learning for college credit. Really interesting, the U.S. Department of Education is really doing a lot of, uh, of work right now to create more experimentation. So they have a, a program called Experimental Sites where they're offering institutions to, to u- utilize financial aid for PLA or for competency-based education. And they're, through this, this process, they're testing it out. And um, they're going to evaluate it. It's, pretty, it's, it's a little bit wild, wild west. But for folks who are early adopters and want to f- see, and they know it's you know, for financial aid, that can be a real difficulty to get those types of things funded. This gives people an avenue to, to experiment. The, the second thing that they're doing, they're sponsoring these First in the World grants. And they're giving lots of money to institutions who are doing innovative things. Are any of you part of a First in the World grant? I know there's, they just, um, they, they just had round two, and they, I think they gave about 15 out, which, you know, which I think added up to seven or eight million dollars, a lot of money. So there's some different, and folks are, are kind of taking their own approaches, and, and the Department of Ed, I guess my, my takeaway here is the Department of Ed is very interested in new ways new ways to do things. And so they're really supporting competency-based education by creating that kind of climate. They're helping, they're supporting PLA, they're supporting direct assessment, they're supporting those types of notions. They're even doing what's called EQIP, which is a, a qual- they're asking uh, institu- or, or institutions or organizations like Kale to sign up to be quality assurance entities. So aside from your accrediting bodies, can there be a, a quality assurance entity that helps evaluate the way ACE does non, you know, w- workplace learning and try to make those bridges to um, institutions? So there's a lot of, a lot of in- interesting stuff going on. Th- these are different options. You, I'm sure you, you heard, we heard discussed earlier today. Um, I think what's imp- important about this is that there's, these, are all, these are all options, and from a Kale perspective, they're all, they're all positive and they help the adult learner. But there are some distinctions for uh, how you're implementing them on your campus. Your processes are important. Uh, we have our, you know, Kale wrote the standards. We've been doing this work for, for over 40 years. Traditionally, the way it worked was we'd go to a single institution, we'd work with a department, and we'd help build their capacity. We had some big research or foundation supported efforts where we trained thousands of assessors. But what happens is, and might happen on your institutions more than likely, people move on, people retire, people change jobs, and all of a sudden where you might have had a really good team working uh, and good quality control for, for prior learning assessment all of a sudden goes out the window. And so that's one reason why learning counts is really gaining favor and and gaining um, interest by institutions who are sincerely interested in doing this at scale and interested in in doing it in a way that they can look at the accreditor in the eye and say, hey, we have the quality assurance we need to do this consistently with iterator reliability, meaning that if if Chris gets a portfolio and someone else gets a portfolio, they're going to come up with the same answer because they have similar processes. Of course, all this comes back to, and this is going back to the research, the reason why this is really gaining force is because it saves students time, it saves students money, it saves, it helps them graduate faster. And so there's opportunity costs that it's, it's helping. So these are all kind of forces um, that are to help driving this, these efforts. If you had to pick, you know, those of you who would say graduate faster, is that a driver for you on your campus, just by show of hands? Yeah? A few? Saving money? Is that a driver? 
couple? Is that saving money from an institutional perspective or saving money from a student yes. perspective? So trying to help the students save money. And then saving time. So trying to get students through more quickly. You know, it, for, we're finding that really changes from uh, geographically because in Texas your, your community college systems are bursting at the seams, whereas in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, that's not the case. And so those folks are really trying to attract students. Private institutions are really trying to use PLA as a driver for enrollment because, and they know that t saving time and money are two critical decision factors for, for adult students. So they're using this as part of their, that's why I'm glad there's a student success person here because that's the type of person that's going to have that interaction on the front end with a student. And if they do that well, that'll be a, 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 a very important decision factor for the adult learner. The, these are researched, and, and I'll, I'll make sure, um, Christine, that we also have the, the, the original research of fueling the race. But we put the Latino study um, on the website. It's on the page. And that's, that was a follow-up that said, you know, why, why, that's counterintuitive. If, if everybody's two and a half times more likely to graduate and then the Latino group is eight times more likely to graduate with PLA, what's going on there? And what we actually found is that uh, at community colleges, there's a lot less robust PLA systems. And so disproportionately, there are, Latinos are going to community colleges. And so those that are utilizing them are doing really well but um, we have a long way to go in terms of having those kinds of robust opportunities for them at community colleges. To what degree do you think that it's um, time of completion and, and exposure to extraneous things that happen to students that take them, derail them, as opposed to the incentive or the scene that I've been Yeah. There's always going to be things that are outside the institution's control. I think in terms of... The shorter the time that right. it takes to completion, the less the external... Yeah, so rule of thumb, life happens, but in a shorter amount of time, less life is going to happen, right? So every, for the, each year you extend, you're going to get a lower you know, uh, retention rate and a lower graduation rate. So, and from an adult learning perspective, just honoring the student, the wisdom that, and the college level learning that they bring to the campus is a way to, to help that student feel understood. But so, which, do you think that they're equal factors or do you think that one, in your observation from the study which I have read, which one do you think is contributing more or do you think they're equal? In terms of the, the, the availability the of PLA? The Well, I think um, there, there is research that says that the portfolio process specifically is, is a motivator. It also helps uh, beyond the college credit. It also helps um, st uh, students clarify their career goals. So there's, there's, a, a, there's other benefits of that process. And there's a reflection aspect of that that we, we think helps. But I think it's also rigorous in a, in a sense and it helps build confidence so that self-efficacy is better with students who have, have done PLA. So those are some hypotheses that are, that are out there. Yep. And one of the other things we actually uh, was discussing in uh, the study I had an advisory group on the ACE last month and, uh, and I think it was Tiffany from Miami Dade who made a comment that also with, uh, when life happens, if you have a lower course load, it's not as bad. So when the students are receiving college first credits, they're taking a lower co course load. So if you have 12 credits and life happens, the world stops. But if you're only carrying six, you can manage that and move on and manage that, that issue in your life as well, too. That was one of the actually I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, but we, we um, formed a partnership with the Texas Association for Community Colleges where there's, we have 500 seats that are available for TACC students 
to do the self-paced course. So the, the TACC presidents have paid for that. The student only pays for the assessment, so it really brings down the cost. But it's a way, it's, it's a pilot, it's a three-year pilot, and uh, we have uh, six or seven schools that are actively kind of going through that pilot right now, but we always want more. So if you're part of that system, there, this, is a, this is something that we're trying to test out because we know that um, these TACC students can really benefit from you know, getting, getting prior learning. That that can, and, and just, to, just to also differentiate the portfolio process, portfolio is targeting a specific course. So on your campus, your faculty have created courses that have specific uh, objectives and outcomes. When a student is doing the portfolio process, they're actually building their portfolio towards the outcomes of that specific course. So there's a, there's a component of the students are striving to meet your outcomes on your, your campus, and you have control over what courses you want to make available for portfolio. So that's, that's I think, some important distinctions, especially when you start to deal uh, around the edges of faculty control issues. I mean, there's, there's faculty that, um, I think there's some good evidence, too, that folks who are concerned about outsourcing the assessment of student learning to somebody other than their faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll probably do our own. It won't be a simple transition in you know, those hours of credit. So Does that depend on how it's transferred? Yeah. Because if we can do it blind, we will. If we can do it blind, we will. Meaning that we'll put it down as the course yeah. right. so that you don't see that it's right. Right. not Absolutely. Yes, that would be There's some important distinctions. In some states, if, if you get the associate's degree, that impacts, it, they won't go back and, and read through the whole associates. They will say, you have this degree, and that, then that impacts which you know, gen ed package you're responsible for at the four-year institution. Because I, I know I see that quite often with the military credit uh, from students transitioning into my program uh, with the military credit, so. There, yeah, and in fact, I think one of the challenges, there's a couple challenges with PLA at community colleges. One is price. It's, uh, it's a very um, subsidized form of higher education as it is. And so when you're talking about $100 or less a credit hour, it's, it's hard to make at least the learning counts uh, kind of model work effectively. So we're, what we're testing with TACC is our self-paced model and um, that actually has a, a, a comparable success rate, but our hypothesis is those who have a higher self-efficacy are the ones that are gravitating towards that um, versus um, folks who are, take our portfolio development course, they might be, um, they need that support. I mean, I think there's some evidence that our community college students are often in need of, of a little bit more hand-holding and walking through the process. But there are some, some important distinctions there in terms of um, making sure that the credit is not just uh, that it's functional in their degree plan rather than just elective credit. So, oh, so you know, this is typically the decision factor on from a campus to campus or a system to system basis. This is this is kind of if you lay out. If you take quality seriously and you lay out what are the things we need to do, this is kind of the distinguishing between doing it yourself, which is a, is a, there's a big lift there in terms of training, in terms of supporting and on, ongoing support for that expertise, training faculty, assessors, those types of things, and the idea of using our learning count system, which 
build some of that in, and you can do some hybrid models. We have what's now called a local assessor first, and we outline it in that PLA adoption uh, resource. But it's where we can train, we, you can use the software and the system of learning counts, but use your local assessors, use your faculty. And so the only time where uh, faculty are used that um, are not part of your system is when there's nobody with subject matter expertise or something like that. So then we revert to our broader network. But it, you, metaphorically, you can talk about it like AP. There, AP exams have a decentralized network of faculty who are trained to assess these. Same, same with learning counts. You have, a, you have a network of faculty across the country with all kinds of different subject matter expertise, and we match up the appropriate faculty with that background and, and Kale training to assess. So then you have a lot more consistency. And that coupled with the portfolio development course um, provides some, both on the front end and the back end, some quality control. One of the things I'll just share with you briefly, because we're piloting right now with Boise State, uh, University of Maryland, and, uh, and Strayer University, is the use of a structured interview protocol, which in this pilot, it will take the place of our narrative. So a student, we're trying to make the, the portfolio process a more uh, approachable way to document their learning, so students can uh, still do a course match, but they're, they'll, they'll work with the faculty or the subject matter expert and do, a, do a, an interview to discuss verbally their, how they match up and understand um, and fulfill the learning objectives. And so we're piloting that right now, but we think it has some promise, especially for students from technical colleges. And um, so we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, so competency, we have, uh, there, the way that movement is working, we have helped about 25 institutions and systems explore what CBE means for them. We're calling it CBE Jumpstart, and it's supported by Public Agenda and Lumina. And so over the course of the last three years, we've taken seven, six or seven a year and helped them, you know, they're trying to determine for their own selves, okay, what does CBE mean for us? So that's the work we've been doing. There's a, there's a second group called CBEN, the Competency-Based Education Network, and those are mostly the, the, the uh, early, the people that have been doing that for a long time. And they're, they're a more, I think, mature network um, of, of folks who are doing this, you know, full time. And, but we're, we're working mostly with the, that beginner set. Other questions? Okay, this may be a, a far afield, so if it is, you can stop. But in supporting some of this assessment, um, I, I've noticed that there are different schools doing it a little differently in that. Um, and I was looking on your site for learning counts. They may give an overview of what's going to be on the assessment and some support. In other places, it's just like you're running blind. Here's the assessment. Hope you have this mastered. There you go. Um, so is there any sort of um, key concept here? Well, I, I call that what you're talking about. I call it the wild, wild west. And as a dean, I, I had some sleepless nights. When, you know, I'm thinking about our, our our CIS faculty would often have like hallway conversations and, and then sign, sign off on students being able to wave out of classes. And for me, that was a scary, you know, not that they weren't competent, but there was no documentation. It was like, I'm, I'm having the dream of the accreditation judge and I'm in, in, in cold sweats, you know. So having some process consistency is, and, and that's, you know, the idea of a shared mental model of how this is going to work for, from an institutional perspective, you still want to honor the subject matter expertise of faculty. So at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be faculty, you know, subject matter experts that are going to assess that, 
that student work, but we need to have some processes in place that is, are consistent and documented. And that's where Learning Counts, the, the software we've developed and all that kind of stuff helps that documentation process and it also helps to have a baseline of training for those assessors. So we have about 1,500 institutions across the country that have in their catalog, we adhere to CAIL standards for PLA. And we're not an accrediting body, so there's really no, they could say that all day long. What we try to say to them is, well, one way to be sure is that you have trained faculty assessors assess the portfolios. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, but I think what's happening is just what you're saying. It's hap there's real unevenness in terms of implementation, and that affects us all negatively because it brings down the trust level across institutions and across systems. So, you know, that's, that's our kind of long-term goal is to, is to really raise that by raising the consistency. How are we on time, Christine? We've got about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, here, here are just some questions for you to, to kind of ask yourselves about how ready are you, is your institution. If you can ask yourself, um, you know, do you define adult learners right now? Do you have, is that something that's tracked? Is that something that you're, um, that's defined in a meaningful way? Do you have support? Are you defining a, what that, that student looks like? I think defining what PLA is and what it isn't is, is important. I think uh, um, in uh, many cases you might have some forms of PLA under testing and other forms in, uh, you know, in student affairs, we've seen it all over the map, but that PLA is your business will help kind of delineate some of the different choices there. We find support, you know, institutional, a sense of urgency is really important. So if you ask yourself from one to 10, you know, what's your sense of urgency <laughs> from your, you know, meaning how clear is your boss about what they want to accomplish with PLA? Are there resources available? I've had comments from, oh, a one to, you know, if you're an eight or a nine, then you, and maybe there's, uh, there's a will, but there's still no systems in place. That's something that you can think about the Alfie toolkit. I tend to have people coming to me when they're, this is kind of so this happens a lot with private institutions that have made their money off traditional 18 to 22 year olds. That population is, is diminishing. And now they're like, oh, well, let's serve adult learners. And it's, it's not that easy. What are other things that, that matter to you? Because I know this is the first of many and we can come back at other times to help build on this, but this is kind of a baseline. Scott, in your, you mentioned an operational handout. Uh, do you address in there financial aid implications when you're talking about financial help? Because two-year systems in this state serve a large majority of students who are physically unable Yep. Whether that's institutional or federal. Do you, do you address that at all? We do, uh, because, and what we thought was a straightforward question of what do you charge is not a straightforward question. And it has to do with what your mental model is, right? So if you think of this as we're investing in uh, it's a retention and student success initiative, or we're thinking of this as something that's taking away from our, you know, what, what they would take credits at our institution. And so the pricing will kind of indicate that. You have folks like Empire State College, statewide, New York. They have 
a really robust PLA system. They charge, you know, between five or six hundred dollars. They make their money back on PLA. You'll have folks like um, Argosy University that doesn't charge at all for PLA, any form of PLA. But they know they'll recruit better, and they know that their persistence and, and success rates will be better. And they're, but it, it, what, in, what it indicates is their vision and the way they, they think about PLA. You know, they mentioned at that um, uh, Phoenix conference that um, you might want to look at your policy with regard to charging and not fix it, not limit it going into the future because they said some populations are willing to pay. Right. And so that can be an income stream where you can serve other students or other populations. So they just said, Try to create craft a flexible policy. Right, and, and there's some change. You know, we've we were su su uh, successful at for military folks making learning counts a national test, and as a national test, it's it's you know you can access GI Bill funds. So there's some different caveats to to those things that that might be helpful if you if you stay in tune with. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's called ALFI, A-L-F-I, the Adult Learner Focused Institution. And we created it about a dozen years ago, and it's validated, uh, research validated to, if you pay attention to those, those nine principles, it will improve your student retention and student success. Now, now several hundred institutions have done that, both two-year and four-year, and you, you, what you, what happens is you get an analysis of your institution's performance from a student perspective. So your students are saying how important is this, are these factors and how well are you pr performing from that student's perspective. And then that's benchmarked nationwide. And so we provide an analysis. But it, it's essentially trying to create a common language for you to talk about on your, you know, if within your culture, if you can't talk about that because there's no language, it's going to be really difficult. So that's that's kind of um, where many of us are at. We're like, goodness, the adult learner is not even on anybody's radar. Well, it is on your state's radar, which is which can help you. There are some great. I was at a, a conference in uh, Austin a couple months ago where some amazing set of data sets related to the adult learner are available for the state of Texas. The other uh, resource I would point you to, in um, the state of Tennessee, they created a guide. So from each function uh, within your university, here's what they need to know about PLA. So like financial aid. What is the fi financial aid person doesn't care necessarily about the, the ins and outs of assessment. What they care about is how does it relate to Title IV and those types of things. So it defines, OK, what does the financial aid person need to know? What does the student success person need to know? And they don't all need to know everything, but they need to know certain specific things. And Tennessee did a nice job of putting that together. And I'll, I'll point, Christine, I'll point it to you, and so maybe you could put it up on the, on the resource. Maybe overly broad question. Um, so we've been talking about adult, adult learners. Uh, can you put that into a, a nutshell? What, what is that definition? Historically, it's 25 and older, but the National Center for Education Statistics, there's about seven characteristics that define adult learners, and, and typically they'll say if you have three of those, you'd be defined as an adult learner. So um, when we do the ALFI, we let the institution define what that means, and mostly they're saying they'll either have very adult-focused programs, they'll say anybody that's in that program, we're going to have them take the survey, or they'll define it very clearly and just say, okay, for better or worse, 25 and older. So it could be just strictly age and okay. now, now, we would say, you know, military populations, you know, those, those folks have dependents working full time. And that's when you get to, when you think of those characteristics, that's when you're getting to the adult learner population 
is just is going through the roof and your traditional population is plummeting because characteristically even the younger students are looking more like non-traditional students. This may be a bit too specific. We have a Bachelor's of Applied Arts and Science program uh -huh. and uh, one of the issues that we in our College of Business and College of Business looking at is that um, um, students come in with 36 to 42 hours or 20 hours of vocational technical credit. And for the, our accreditation, we are looking for ASCSB, the business mm -hmm. accreditation. That seems to be an issue with the accrediting agency. We are trying to uh, look at either PLA or uh, um, the competency based plan right. to somehow convert these hours to so that we, this is equivalent to business hours. I don't know if there's any program out there that's actually doing something similar that we can, that we can look at. Yeah, well, actually we, there's a research brief on our website. Um, uh, it's, it's called at, um, at Arm's Length. Uh, it's talking about accrediting, what a different accrediting bodies are saying about uh, PLA. And so it looks at the six regionals, but there's also a, a follow-up to that on more of the professional AACSB or ACBSP or those different accrediting bodies, um, what they're saying. Um, we just met with the Northwest. You know, there's some parameters. 25% uh, of the degree can be used in PLA, those types of things. Um, so that could be some more specific data for you if you're looking for what, what research is out there. Okay. I'm going to leave. I have a bunch of my cards I'll leave as well. But, you know, Kale has been working on this for over 40 years. We're, not, we're a nonprofit. Our mission is really, our vision is actually that every adult can have meaningful work, learning, and credentials. And so that's our, that's our vision. That's what we're working towards. If we could be helpful for you on your campus, within your system, uh, we'd love to do that. We've been doing uh, some really meaningful work with, like I said, the Texas Association for Community Colleges. Um, we've been trying to, we've, we have several different projects going on uh, in Houston, and, but we'd, we'd love to work with you. Alamo Colleges, Bruce Leslie uh, is on our board and has been real active uh, for the, I think he was the chair of our board a couple years ago. So um, if there's any follow-ups, Please, please let me know. I'd love to be helpful. Thank you.